Hi guys, uh, this is your science teacher here with another video. This time it's on B3 organisation and the digestive system. Remember to find all other videos on my channel. I go through all of the content uh, on the AQA GCSE syllabus. We're going to start off the video by looking at the levels of organisation inside um, our bodies. Um, and we're going to start from smallest and work up to the largest um, uh, parts of our body. Uh, the first is our cells and actually we know that there's actually something smaller in cells. We know about the organelles, the things that make up cells. You know for example that a cell is made up of a nucleus, um, um, cell membrane, cytoplasm and has mitochondria and ribosomes inside it. When cells are working together to achieve a particular function uh, and they're all similar cells, that's known as a tissue. Um, for example, uh, if you think of the organ of the heart, that contains muscle tissue in order to make that heart pump. You've probably heard about the larger one, the organ, uh, and an organ is just a bunch of tissues working together in order to achieve a particular function. Uh, for example, the heart, like I said, that contains muscle tissue, but it also contains valves and blood tissues valves and blood vessels. Then after organs we have organ systems and these are organs that work together for a particular function as well. So think about it, the digestive system is a type of organ system. Uh, also the cardiovascular system that involves the heart and lungs. We have the digestive system which involves many organs that involves uh, the pancreas, the liver, the stomach, the intestines. Uh, so there's the organ systems are vital for our life processes and um, there's one step more which is organisms and an organism is any uh, living thing and it's comprised of lots of organ systems working together uh, for example a human is an example of an organism um, it's just any living thing but it's often complex uh, because of all the, the little things as, as you can see we break it down into smaller and smaller each time uh, and we can see that it's comprised of many tiny things. We're going to look at an organ system in detail now. We're going to look at the digestive system. We're now going to go on a journey through the digestive system, just like the journey that food takes uh, when you start eating. Digestion obviously starts in the mouth. The moment that you put food into your mouth, digestive process has begun. And it's more complex than you actually think think the mouth because of the salivary glands as well uh, down here and we'll talk about it in a bit more detail. The mouth obviously uh, breaks up your food into smaller pieces um, but then it's mixed with the saliva isn't it okay and this is um, part of the digestive system because the saliva actually contains digestive enzymes uh, in particular amylase uh, which breaks down carbohydrates and we'll look how it does that uh, in a couple of slides time um, so it mainly contains amylase and once you've chewed the food up into small enough pieces it travels down the esophagus it travels down the esophagus uh, it doesn't go down the windpipe that's sometimes a, a misconception if it goes down your windpipe it would end up uh, getting jammed uh, and that wouldn't be good. That's sometimes how you can choke uh, and you cough the food straight back up. Uh, so it travels down the esophagus all the way until it reaches the stomach. And this is the next big one I want to talk to you about. Because uh, the stomach is where a lot of the digestion takes place. The stomach uh, contains actually hydrochloric acid. Um, and that obviously helps break down the food. Uh, and it also contains um, some enzymes which are pumped in uh, by the liver. So we'll talk about the liver as well. Uh, but it also contains some enzymes which help break down the food. And, and I said we're going to look at what enzymes do. So don't worry if you don't really know what an enzyme does just yet. We're going to talk about it in quite a bit of detail. So the next organ is this liver, like I said, that we were going to talk about. And the liver... Uh, is amazing, okay? It has one of the largest roles in the digestive system. The liver produces a substance called bile. Uh, you might have seen some bile before. It's not a very good looking uh, uh, 
chemical is is kind of like a green goo sometimes you cough it up uh, it's not very pretty um and bile helps break down fats uh, which is very important it's harder to break down fats than a lot of the other uh, substances you eat in your food so uh, it's important that it's there bile doesn't just break down fat it also uh, helps neutralize uh, the acid in the stomach think about it if your body's producing all this acid that can't be good for your stomach all the time you need to uh, you need to also uh, neutralize that acid uh, before the food moves on or else you would have uh, massive acid burns in your belly and that wouldn't be very nice okay that's sometimes how you feel a bit sick once uh, the foods travel through the stomach it goes into the small intestine and this is ne nearly where all the absorption takes place okay this is where all the useful uh, parts of your food come out okay uh, the small intestine is incredibly long in fact, it's a 22 foot long muscular tube that breaks down the food using enzymes released by the pancreas and the bile from the liver. Um, and it mixes with digestive juices. And because of the fact the walls are really thin in the small intestine, it means that the useful nutrients can absorb into your bloodstream. The large intestine is the next process of the digestive system. And uh, the large intestine basically uh, processes this waste and passes it out uh, through the um, anus so it processes all the waste left over um, now I know there is a lot of extra stuff uh, on this diagram you don't need to know it all in that much detail however there's one uh, more that I kind of need to talk about and that's the gallbladder here um, and gallbladder helps store bile We're now going to look at uh, different food groups that are broken down in the digestive process, mainly uh, in the small intestine and the stomach, where most of digestive uh, most of digestion takes place. Um, the first one we're going to look at is proteins up here, uh, and proteins are quite complex, okay? Uh, and you can kind of tell they're quite complex by the shapes that I've used. And um, proteins are broken down by a digestive enzyme called protease, and it breaks it down into the different amino acids that make it up. For example, this could be amino A, this could be amino D, and this could be amino E. Um, and uh, once it's broken down, then it can uh, travel through uh, the small intestine and uh, be absorbed into the bloodstream. It can't um, be absorbed when it's so large and in its protein state. That's the whole point of digestion, is to break it down into smaller pieces so that it can be absorbed. Now, carbohydrates can come in two forms. They can be complex or they can be simple, uh, but they're still broken down um, by the same uh, protein, uh, by the same enzyme, okay? And that enzyme is known as amylase. And, um, once the uh, carbohydrate is broken down, it is broken down into a substance you've probably heard of uh, called glucose, which we use for our energy. Now, in, you find simple car carbohydrates in foods that are high in sugar and complex carbohydrates uh, in foods like pasta and bread. And that's why they give you longer lasting energy. It's because they take longer to be broken down uh, into glucose. Um, so you get like a steadier stream of glucose. So you don't get like a hard hit of glucose. And that's what's why people get sugar rushes and get sugar highs from drinking uh, fizzy drinks and uh, things like energy drinks. The last one we're going to look at is uh, lipids. And when lipids get broken down, uh, they, they get broken down by a substance called lipase, which is the enzyme and uh, they get broken down into fatty acids and a substance called glycerol and that glycerol is kind of like the backbone uh, to the fatty acid so it kind of looks uh, like that the glycerol so that's that's how it's broken down now i said bile also helps down in the break up of lipids and it does it kind of emulsifies uh, it, which means that it kind of makes it into smaller uh, 
clumps, basically. Now, it's important to know how much protein, uh, how much carbohydrates and starch and fats are in each food. Uh, and we can use a food test uh, to see whether they are present in any of uh, the foods that we're eating. For example, for a protein, uh, what you need to do is you need to add a solution called burette solution. And if it turns uh, into a purple color, uh, you'll know that there is a protein uh, available in that food. Um, now, with starch, you can test that with iodine. Uh, carbohydrates and starch, you can test with iodine and that will go uh, black if it's present. Now, to test for simple sugars, uh, you can use a, a substance called Benedict's solution. And Benedict's, if there is a lot of uh, sugar, that will go red. So that's another type um, of solution. And lipids, you can test using ethanol and water. And if an emulsion forms, then uh, you will have uh, lipids present in your food. Now, it's important for these food tests. Uh, sometimes you need to use a pestle and mortar, and that starts to break down process, doesn't it? Okay, so you can, you can kind of act like the mouth, okay, uh, in the digestive system. You can add a little bit of water as well, a bit of distilled water in there, and you crush with a pestle and mortar, and then you add the solution. Uh, to test whether that uh, nutrient is present in the food. Enzymes work in a specific way and they work using a mechanism known as the lock and key mechanism. And uh, Basically how this lock and key mechanism works is the substrate arrives and it will bind uh, to your enzyme. Now it's important to remember that each enzyme has a different active site shape. This uh, active site allows the substrate to come in and bind to it. Uh, but each enzyme is specific to each one of them nutrients. That's why each nutrient has a specific enzyme. Um, once the substrate has bound to it, what the enzyme does is it changes uh, the size of its active site and that changes the substrate that's bound to it. And when the substrate uh, leaves, it will leave as two separate products and it will therefore be smaller and therefore be easier to be digested. It's very similar to when we look at communicable diseases, looking at how our uh, antibodies, our lymphocytes, uh, attach to antigens. It's very similar. That works by like almost like a lock and key mechanism where it's specific. The active site will only fit one substrate. Now, because uh, these enzymes speed up the digestion, they are known as biological catalysts. And that is kind of the definition of an enzyme, is that they are biological catalysts. And also that term catalyst is important because catalyst means that you're not changed, okay? And that's important about enzymes as well. Uh, they're not changed, they can be used again and again. The reason why enzymes uh, are found in different parts of the body um, and not all in the same part of the digestive system is because of the fact um, that enzymes have optimum pHs and optimum temperatures that they work at. Remember, we looked at the active site on the last slides and I've, I've got the enzyme also over here. Well, the active size can actually change shape at certain temperatures and certain pHs um, and that can be negative uh, have a negative effect on uh, the breakdown process because of, of the fact that no uh, nutrients can bond to the active site if uh, it's changed shape. So let's look at a graph showing the activity of an enzyme, a particular enzyme at a certain temperature. Now, it, in fact, if the temperature is too low, the activity is going to be really low because um, the nutrients aren't moving enough uh, and the uh it's, it's just going to be too slow think about any reaction they need to collide they need to uh, collide with enough energy uh, in order for a reaction to take place so it's just not going to work very well at a low temperature uh, and it kind of increases until you get to its certain temperature which is known as its optimum optimum temperature and then it falls back down quite sharply once you've uh, reached a certain temperature so its optimum temperature would be about here where it's um 
This would be its optimum temperature and this would be uh, where it's working at its highest activity. Um, and if we look at the pH one, that would also follow a certain pattern as well, but it could be more sharp, for example, if it liked working in acidic conditions. However, if that enzyme was found in a place where uh, you're, you're neutral, uh, you have like a neutral pH, it would be uh, more of a curve like this. So you could see optimum pHs and temperatures being different. Um, but why do we get these curves? Well, what happens is uh, our enzymes are said to become denatured. That means that the active site has changed shape. Uh, and in fact, they can become fully denatured at this temperature here. And that basically means the enzymes no longer work. Uh, the active site has changed so much that no uh, nutrient will bond to it anymore. And the same thing happens with the pHs. They become uh, denatured and nothing can bond to them. Nothing, the substrate can't bind uh, to the enzyme and be broken down. But it's just important to remember that with the pH graphs, uh, depending on where in the body the enzyme is found, the optimum pHs can be very different. For example, this uh, optimum pH is very acidic. You could have a pH of about 2. That enzyme would work very well in the stomach. However, it wouldn't work very well in the mouth. This uh, uh, pH would uh, be about 7. Uh, so it would uh, be very good for the mouth because the mouth's quite neutral, a little bit acidic but uh, it would have an optimum pH there. So that could be uh, an enzyme like amylase, for example, which is found in the salivary glands. That is the end of uh, this video. Remember, if you liked the video, please uh, like the video on YouTube. And if you like my content, please subscribe to my channel.